hey everybody welcome into uh, another edition of for the cheers i have a very special guest excited to have carrie zabagnan joining me today carrie thanks for joining uh, how's it going how are you uh, keeping up during these these weird times everything's going well obviously uh at home we're safe and we're healthy and and i think when i talk to a lot of different people everyone's raring to get back on the field and, and that's probably the next the next step but uh first and foremost we're healthy uh, and we're looking out for everybody that's around us, making sure that we keep our distancing with people and abide by what the what the experts are telling us. So um, we could be in a much worse situation. So we're thankful for the ones that we're in right now. Yeah, definitely. Are, are you? Uh, I, I feel like this is the standard video call question these days. Are you guys uh, binge watching anything? Are you a reader? What What are you doing to spend the time? Yeah, I'll tell you, I've had the opportunity to kind of uh, do a little audit of my my uh, my TV uh, subscriptions, and so it, it it's become the more the more I look into it, the more complicated it becomes. I mean, the the, the choice of of uh, of uh, usage or the choice of uh, subscribers and products that you can have on the on the market these days is is a little bit overwhelming. I remember back in the day, you just would sign up with it. A cable company and they would be your provider so i've really gone down some some really bad rabbit holes with that uh but i've i've been binge watching a number of things uh it's been been a constant uh you know thing with my wife and i that that after our daughter goes to bed we turn on our netflix with ozark and uh, we're watching schitt's creek right now so there's there's some good shows that uh i've had the opportunity to binge watch obviously uh, without the games being played, it's it's an opportunity to spend time with the family and and as you said, binge watch. Yeah, uh, well, man, I'm getting Ozark a lot. I need to check that one out. I, I've heard some good things about that. It seems to be a yeah. right now. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm watching way too much TV, man. Um, well, <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us. I'd like to do a little cheers here. Cheers to you. Cheers. Cheers. One thing uh, that we've been doing a lot during the, this uh, downtime is we've been posting a lot of old games onto sportingkc.com. Obviously, it's the 25th year of, of MLS and celebration has been a, a dampened a little bit, but um, you've been there from the beginning. So I just kind of want to pick your brain on some, some stuff throughout your MLS career. Um, and I want to start with a kind of a wacky one. Who do you think was your most underrated teammate? Oh, good question. Um, hmm. I sprung that one on you. Yeah, that that that's a tough question. And going throughout all the years, I I, I think, look, Dave, Dave Arnold had certainly gotten his his share of of plaudits across the league. But I remember when he first came into the to the to the team, uh, just an unheralded college player coming out and and I think the way that he rose throughout the ranks was particularly uh, interesting to see. I think Jack Jewsbury um, really maximized uh, and was a key point, uh, key player in our team that probably didn't get a tremendous allow, uh, uh, amount of credit. Um, I, I think there were back in the day when I first came into the, into the team, of course you knew Tony Miola, uh, Peter Vermes, uh, even Nick Garcia, but Brandon Perdoe was a stalwart defender uh, that didn't get a lot of credit um, in a team that was probably one of the best defensive teams uh, in the history of a league. So I think he he deserved uh, more credit. Um, and, and, you know, look, there, there, there's been a lot of players individually, but I think what's been the hallmark of the teams that I've played on and, and the organization as a whole is that it, it's always revolved around the team concept. And so individual underrated players, I think what, what's happened is, is that a lot of players have come into the club and they've actually maximized what their capacity was. Um, the environment that they were put into allowed them to do that. And therefore, you've had a lot of success with a lot of teams that didn't necessarily have fantastic uh, individual talented players. Um, not to take away from the players that have come through our club with uh, that were a little bit um, above the grade in terms of ability and talent, but it's been such a team concept that it's, it's really difficult to pinpoint 
players that really didn't get the recognition over the years. Sure. Um, I asked that question because I kind of, I don't know if other people feel this way, but I feel like the 04 team that you guys had is a little underrated in terms of uh, the Pantheon. Obviously you win uh, Open Cup, um, fantastic team. And you were on, uh, on the best 11 that season. What do you remember about being named to the All-Star game and, and then to the best 11 at the end of the season? A wonderful year for you. Yeah, it, two, 2004 was uh, a really good year that, that, that had a, a group of players that were involved in the national team program. Um, and I think those early January camps really put us uh, on, on, on the level that was a little bit above uh, a lot of the other teams. I think we had Josh Wolf, we had uh, Jimmy Conrad, myself. Um, there, there were a number of players uh, Chris Klein, that were going into the national team program at that time and factored into the qualification that year. And so I think we had a number of players that were in really good form. Um, we found our footing as a team early in the season and kind of catapulted our way through the Open Cup and came up just short in the in the final against D.C. But that, that was a really, uh, really special year, despite the fact that we didn't cap it off with the MLS Cup. But it was a good team. It was a hardworking team, and, and uh, uh, it was a year that just seemed to click. You guys won the Open Cup in some of the craziest circumstances I've seen. What, what was that like, a walk-off, free kick, golden goal? Yeah, that was, that was interesting. And, and, you know, when you look back on those games, and, and it's really hard for me to pinpoint exactly how the game unfolded, and, and many games during that time for that matter, but – I do remember the conditions. I remember a, a, a fairly vacant uh, Arrowhead Stadium, whereas you look to our, our recent Open Cup victories and even the one in Philadelphia, it's just a completely different atmosphere uh, to be playing in. But I remember the excitement of playing in a final. Um, I remember, uh, you know, Igor Simotankov, uh, his fantastic goal. Uh, I believe it was a deflection. Was that correct? Or did, he, did it go right in? Yeah, I say like fantastic team. goal because of the timing of it. Yeah. Um, but but it was a it was a choppy field. It was a it was a difficult game. And I think if you were to go back and watch that now, aesthetically, it probably wasn't the most pleasing, especially when you see where the level of the game has come now. But it was a it was a highly contested game, um, and certainly very satisfactory as you, you're able to lift the trophy. At that time, Lamar Hunt, uh, the Hunt family, the owners of the team, to be able to. Uh, present that trophy to his family um, and walk off the field as champions was really a, a special feeling. Yeah, that incredible. Golden goal. That's just yeah. – uh, um, you talk about the growth of the league, and we'll get to that in this just a second, but um, the golden goal kind of reminds me of um, some of the rules that were in place at the beginning of the league, and an interesting piece from Pablo Mara of The Athletic came out about the U.S. ISL and some of the wacky rules in that league where they kind of use it as a, uh, a proving ground for MLS. You, you played in that league. Do you remember much about the experience in that league and any, any of the rules stand out in your memory? Yeah, I, well, of course, the shootout of the early years is probably the one that's replayed the most. Um, I, I remember in the USISL, and I was still a college player at the time, um, going down and playing with the Raleigh Flyers, um, as a semi-pro, uh, still in amateur status. But um, there was a rule within the game that a goal scored from long distance, I believe. It was kind of like the indoor game that passed the blue line. There, there, was, a, there was a line or, that was designated beyond maybe 30 yards that if you scored, I believe it counted for two points. Wow. Um, now, don't quote me on that, but there was some, some uh, interesting – twist to that rule um, that tried to, you know, look at, at the time people were talking about, um, you know, we want more scoring, we want more numbers, we want more goals. And so that was one of the unique ways of trying to add more numbers to the scoreboard. Um, but the shootout was probably the one that, that really, uh, I think, stands out. The golden goal and the, the, the excitement of golden goals, I remember Mo Johnson's goal that uh, that capped off the Western Conference Finals. Probably one of the one of the greatest moments that I've had as a player on the field uh, to experience what the what the Golden Goal really uh, the excitement that can come from a Golden Goal 
Um, that was probably one moment that stands out, but certainly some unique rules in those early years. Yeah, and it has, I, I advise you to check out that piece from Palomar. It's pretty interesting. I'm sure you'd get a, a kick out of it. They talk yeah. about uh, the stampede shot uh, in, in, in that league as well. So there's some, some stuff I've yeah. seen. It's pretty interesting. Um, well, th that leads to the growth of, of the league as a whole in 25 years. Um, what's it been like for you to, to be there when this thing started and, and now as a coach to, to see it go the 25 years it has and turn into what it has turned into? Yeah, I, I, I think it's been a, uh, a really uh, calculated growth um, by some very intelligent investors and owners. Um, not to mention the commissioner has done a fantastic job of navigating um, our league from 10 teams all the way up to now 26 and growing. Um, that doesn't come by just a few people getting together with some good ideas. That, that, that's, that's the collaboration and work of many, many people from players to coaches to administrators to owners. Um, it, it's, it's really been interesting to play a really small part in, the, in the, the progress of the league. I think, you know, and I hear people talk about, you know, if, if you would have told me 25 years ago that this is where we would have been, or even in Kansas City, if you told me 10 years ago that we would have grown this much, I tell you you're crazy. I, I think there's some merit to that, but at the same time, I, I've, I've been privy to a lot of the things that have been going on behind the scenes and working towards really realizing uh, some of the things that are coming to fruition right now. And I would say that on one hand, I am slightly surprised at the speed, but by no means am I surprised that we've been able to accomplish what we have. Um, and that has to do with what I said, a, a really um, intelligent group, committed group of people, um, starting with the owners of our leagues. Um, it, it, it was uh, founded, obviously, with the Phil Anschutz's, the, the, the Crafts, the, the Hunts of the world. But we've had some fantastic owners, not to mention the ones that we have in Kansas City, um, that, that have really taken this league to another level. So um been great to be a part of uh can't imagine not uh being a part of uh the continued growth because there's so much more excitement i believe that's around the corner um that if we get kind of bogged down on the, the immediate or the short term of the situation that we're in right now i think we lose sight of the trajectory that we are on and the the the, uh, the levels i think in which we're going to take this league yeah 100 percent agree with that um I'll leave this final question. You've had some wonderful moments as a coach with uh, with Sporting KC. What's it like being on the sidelines for a, a penalty kick shootout to to win a trophy uh, as a coach, uh, as opposed to as opposed to being a player? Yeah, it, it it's almost become a little bit of a norm now uh, to to find <laughs> ourselves in these situations. And and I I promise you, it's not something that we calculate when we go into finals. It's not. We don't try to get the penalty kicks. It's not part of our strategy. But I will say that, and, and the core guys, that some of them that are still here, um, the, the medal that they've shown in those key moments, of course, the preparation that goes into that from the, from the coaching staff, most notably the, the, the messaging that, that Peter gives to the players and the rest of the staff does, uh, the confidence um, to, to go into those moments. It's, it's a bit nerve-wracking. Um, I will say this, though. Some of the things that I personally get worried about in, in games uh, and lead-ups to games, I find myself, myself in, the, in the penalty kick shootouts knowing that, look, it's, it's, it's a crapshoot, right? It, it, it's, it's a 50-50. Um, I do remember the, the 2013 Cup Final being – more relaxed probably than I should have been um, because when I go back and I watch it, I'm much more nervous. And maybe I was exceptionally cold uh, like many people, <laughs> but, but as we were going through that, I had no right and no supporter of Kansas City had any right to be relaxed. But I somehow felt in that specific game and moment that we were going to pull it off. And, and I, I can't explain how or why um, – I felt that way or how we were going to pull it off. Um, by no means did I think Aureli and Colin was going to slot the ball in the corner because in the lead up to the games, I don't think he hit the 
hit, hit the ball on target in one of our exercises. So when we got to that point, uh, that was one of the shots that I, I didn't watch. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, I talked to Jimmy Nielsen, and, and he said he tried to stop Aurelian from coming to take it and wanted to take it in, in front of him. He did. He did. And, and I remember looking down at him, and he's, he's basically putting his finger on the top of his head saying, me, I, I, I want to take it. And in my head, I didn't say, I obviously didn't say anything, but I was thinking, you know, that might not be the worst idea. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, credit to Aurelian. Well. He, he put yeah. it top corner, you know? No, he did. He did. I, and, and look, Nick Romando guessed the right way. Um, he, he, the ball was at a level that most goalkeepers will, will, will get to, um, but it was put in the, it, it, it another inch wider and it hits the post and likely goes out and an inch closer and, and Nick gets his fingertips on it. And so, um, you know, you just have to look back on that and say it, it was, it was meant to be. I mean, it, it was, it was a fantastic season. It was a, uh, incredible environment. Probably if I had to pick, um, the, the most rewarding, satisfying, electrifying championships that we've had, um, that would be the one. Um, as a player, the 2000 uh, is is the one that stands out. But the 2013 championship is probably, with all the the, the implications, the fans, the excitement. I haven't been around a, an environment like that uh, in, in in any other arena. Yeah. Well, cheers to that. Cheers yeah. Cheers to, to that. that. Hopefully, some. Cheers to another one. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Well, awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining, Kerry. Really great to talk to you. Glad to hear that you and the family are, are doing well, and hopefully we're back to playing here soon. Yeah, fingers crossed. Stay yeah. safe. Uh, great catching up with you, and we'll see you soon. Cool. Thanks, Kerry. Right. Pleasure.